Welcome to my video recapping my ride down the Great Divide mountain bike route. This stretches from Banff all the way down to Mexico and after doing the Colorado and the Arizona trail over the last few years this was the big one left. I didn't have time to do it in one year so this is part one from Banff down to the bottom of Wyoming and hopefully I will complete part two over Colorado and New Mexico in the next year. Like all these trails there's a lot of up and downhill a total of around 200,000 feet for the whole Tour Divide trail. Similar to last year I raised money again for the Zambian carnivore program a very well deserved uh, conservation entity based in Zambia. Well the bike was all packed up and I flew off to Calgary as my entry point into Canada. Lovely city, one of the most livable ones in the world and my hotel room turned into a, an expedition room as I put the bike together. Eventually having to hitch a ride on an Uber to get to Banff for the start of the main ride. The Spray River West Trail is the beginning of the whole ride and it's lovely single track sloping downhill nice and fast and fun to ride and immediately there's scenery on either side of the valley. Crossing to the other side of the valley, you start making your way down the Spray Lakes Reservoir and I pulled up stakes for the night at this beautiful campsite on the small little lake. Gorgeous morning views in all directions of the lake, whether it's to the west or the east, some beautiful peaks peeking out. After some rain overnight, it was a crisp clear morning as I made my way further down the valley, mostly sloping slightly downhill. And on either side of the valley, you have these tremendous mountain scenery that's gorgeous in the morning light. And it's hard to keep your eyes on the trail or the road as you know, you're distracted by all this amazing scenery. Eventually you get to one of the highlights, the High Rockies Trail, probably some of the best single track on the entire Divide Trail. It was a bit sketchy in the morning. There were at least two huge piles of grizzly poop, one of them still steaming, and it wasn't from Mama Bear or Baby Bear. It was definitely from Papa Bear. Then you get to this gorgeous suspension bridge, and pretty soon you're back on the main road after that again with beautiful mountain scenery as you make your way towards Elk Pass which puts you over the divide for the first time and that is the way to get from Alberta into BC and start your second state. Gorgeous scenery around this area as you then slowly make your way down the Elk Valley. After a long day and about 70 miles I hit Coco Pass, arguably one of the hardest things on the entire trail up these rock and scree slopes. Fortunately there was a hut at the top that I could stay in overnight because I arrived here utterly exhausted. I felt somewhat rested in the morning and made my way down the back side of Coco Pass. Not nearly as steep as the front side but still very technical in areas. Eventually you get down to this valley and uh, it slopes slowly downhill so lovely valley to put some miles down and uh, enjoy a fairly smooth ride along a very nice gravel road. Either open like this or deep into the trees. Then eventually you get to Sulphur Creek and there's a pass along it that takes you back over the mountain and to the adventure town of Fernie. Great place to spend a couple of days. But unfortunately I did not have the time and had to carry on. A good morning in Canada. My last night here before heading into the US. Uh, Canada trip got cut short a little bit because there's a big fire in the flathead section passed by a whole lot of firefighters yesterday setting up camps 
and hopefully there's not too much on the US side of the border. It's been incredibly beautiful going through Canada all the way down from Banff. Uh, Coco Pass was probably the hardest thing I've ever done on a mountain bike or bikepacking. I mean, literally pushing it up a scree field after 70 odd miles that day, then going up there into the evening. Fortunately, there was a hut at the top and I got there in the dark and uh, was able to uh, just sleep in the hut and not having to pitch a tent. But yeah, yesterday was a long day from there all the way down. And just by chance, I stepped into a bike store in Fernie to add a bit of air to my uh, front fork. And they told me about the fire. Otherwise, I would have had to reroute after, you know, a day or so of traveling in that direction and come all the way back. So, found this little wild camping site. Uh, about 30 odd miles from the border and we'll be heading down there now and start the Montana side Just keeping fingers crossed that the fires are not too bad Ah video note Not all truck drivers are assholes, but it seems like all assholes drive trucks Just wish some people would slow down a bit when they pass you Or come closer nice people do but others just see how much dust they can get on you but you know people are people you can only do so much riding along at cycling speeds you can't help but notice the amount of aluminum cans next to the road probably has something to do with open container laws that uh, make people throw them out the windows even if it's non-alcoholic but one can rules them all. I don't know if it's just the most popular beer or if it attracts a certain kind of person, but Bud Light by far had the most cans out there, sadly. After crossing the border, got to the small town of Eureka, Montana. Quite a quaint little town and uh, filled up on some provisions before heading out over the divide again. There was a lot of signs at the roads about closures due to the same fire that was also on the Canadian side. So a few nervous moments until I figured out that I will actually be able to go up the Whitefish Divide. Starting off as a very nice paved road. This takes you up higher and higher as you climb back up and over the divide. Beautiful scenery on either side, lush valleys, a bit of fire damage in a few areas, but also thick green trees in other areas. And in the distance you start seeing some of the first mountains that are actually on the border with Glacier National Park. Of course, this is prime bear habitat, and I got to Tuchuk campground that was technically closed due to bear activity, but it seemed like it was a few weeks ago, so I took my chances, and thankfully everything worked out. Ah, great way to spend a Monday morning in the office. The trail keeps heading east to the foot of the mountains that forms the border with Glacier National Park, and then after a little while going south, you turn southwest again and up Red Meadow Pass. At the top of the pass this year are these beautiful lakes. Quite refreshing to take a dip here. Before you head downhill again and eventually get to Upper Whitefish Lake. The backcountry in Montana is just spectacular and pretty remote in places. Just crossed the divide twice in the last day and a half and today spent about, I don't know, half a day driving without seeing any other humans and just the, the far off wilderness. Eventually you drop down to Whitefish Lake, which you follow for a while to Whitefish Town where I got some provisions again before making my way through some farmland that uh, sort of rolls further south some interesting murals in Columbia Falls as the shadows started to lengthen I started wondering about where I'm going to spend the night 
and came across the sign where this lovely couple, Tom and Pam, invite cyclists to camp on their lawn. They retired, he was a pilot in the Korean War, just warm hospitality, lots of stories and laughter and a wonderful evening. Everyone in this area seemed to have an opinion about how life should be lived and even the convenience store has some trophies on the wall. Making my way from Ferndale up this long grinding pass. Not too steep, just long and grinding and man it's hot today. Started off actually in the high 40s, it was chilly this morning, but man, it must be in the 90s now and just unrelenting in the sun. It's always the hard part, these middle hours of the day when you're just slogging on. Hopefully I get to a river or a lake and I can just sort of, you know, douse my t-shirt and it needs a wash anyway. For most of the ride today, the trail's flanked by tall trees, but frustrating at times because you never really get beautiful views. Occasionally the mountains peek out through a thinner part and uh, you wish you could see more of it. But on the other hand, it was also a beautiful trail and nice to be sort of enveloped in greenery. Eventually the mountains came out just as you get towards the Holland Lake area where I camp for the night in a, what's supposedly a horse camp. Starting up Richmond Pass the next morning, the trees do thin out a little bit and you get more and more mountain views as you go up high. There's even some lovely single track sections, some quite thick like this one and then others following an old uh, road grade that actually takes you over the very top of the pass. Once you crest the pass, it's glorious single track. You know, probably one of my two favorite areas so far when it comes to single track. Flowing down the mountain through some burn areas as well, making your way down to Sealy Lake. And then there's a very dusty road that takes you over to Ovando. A highlight for many on the trail, Quirky Ovando has really embraced the Tour Divide and cyclists, providing some interesting accommodations. This one used to be an old jail, there's some wagons, or people sleep in the church hall, especially after someone got attacked by a bear last year. It was a bit too busy for me, so I decided to push on in the late evening light and make my way to the foot of Huckleberry Pass where I decided to stay at the lovely Big Nelson campground right on this gorgeous lake. Up and over Huckleberry Pass in the morning leads to some lovely downhill cycling on the road down towards Lincoln. After passing this empty bar and stocking up on some food, I made my way up Stemple Pass. Met this lovely couple, Anna and Jeremy from Santa Fe, who was on the first leg of making their way around the world. Eventually up and over the pass, nice little downhill down to the renowned Llama Farm. Another of the iconic stops along the route, the Llama Farm has these cabins that you can stay in for free. So it's very popular with cyclists heading up or down the Tour Divide. Llamas to keep you company. And then Barbara and her husband just offers the most warm and wonderful hospitality. I so wish I could spend the night, but I had to push on to Helena since I had a mail package to pick up. After stopping at the historic Empire Mine, I made my way over the rest of Priest Pass and started descending a little bit on the Helena side into the evening light and then came across an obstacle I never imagined. A train that's a couple of miles long just blocking my way going forward. This has been a problem I haven't come across yet on uh, the Divide Trail. There's this massive train. I was just parked here for the last 20 minutes until another train passed. I'm trying to get to Helena before sunset 
and it's kind of putting a wrinkle in my plans but thankfully it just started moving so yay I should be able to go on my or get on my way sometime soon well I didn't make it to Helena that night and found a little wild campsite but the next morning it was a short way downhill into town where I could finally sit down for a proper breakfast it was about time to do something like that while I'm charging my devices and also put some new brake pads on the bike and then swung through town had a look at the Montana capital a little bit of street art it's my first time in Helena so it was kind of interesting to see a bit more of the town but it was getting really really hot uh, this time of the year and pretty soon I was heading out of town past the limestone kilns and came across this lovely couple not only did they supply me with water to fill up my water bottle but they also donated to the Zambia carnival program further up the hill I ran into some bikers from England I believe and there was a lovely lake to take a dip in Riding on Quito, cheese is your friend. You can find it in just about any store and you're going through calories so quick. I mean, even a half a pound of cheese just goes down like nothing, but it's a great lunch. Horseradish this time. It's actually quite nice. Hopefully we'll feel the next 40 or 50 miles. Man, it's so hot today. Pushing a hundred and uh, Pushing a bike up a four-wheel drive track for mile after mile is not really conducive to getting over the heat. Thankfully there's a bit of a breeze, but man, so brutally hot today. At least the downhill towards Basin, Montana finally delivered some relief as you feel the wind in your hair. This is so funny, I'm in Basin, Montana. You know, quite a remote little spot. <laughs> all these old ladies going on an evening stroll for some water. And you know, one turned on the hose next to her house, very, very friendly. And I fill my water bottles and saves me a lot of time since I still want to get to Butte tonight. <laughs> and then she said like, oh, it's so hot, I can hose you down. And before I can start, you know, actually tell her no, I'm just going to rinse my t-shirt or something. She's just hosing me all over. So I'm like totally wet and my shoes and everything. <laughs> so <laughs> this is so funny. But yeah, I got a good hosing in uh, Basin, Montana. I spotted their bikes at the aptly named cafe and soon ran into Stevie and Taylor. We've been leapfrogging each other for a couple of days, but on this occasion I wanted to push on to Butte and actually rode into the night. Jonesing for an hotel and a proper shower and a way to charge all my devices. And then when I got to Butte at 11 o'clock at night, there was not a single hotel room available in the whole town. Well, I was forced to wild camp on the outskirts of town and then roll into Butte the next morning. A little bit of sightseeing of this historic mountain town, but more importantly, a proper resupply of food and sunscreen and other items, including the famous drovors that I eat every night. Also stopped at a restaurant for a proper meal and then headed south of town and started going up towards the divide again. Once over the divide, you start making your way down into the next valley again, past some beautiful ranches and across the freeway before heading out into the hills again, where I spend the night at Beaver Dam campsite. Next up was the dreaded Fleecer Ridge. Started out okay and I was wondering why everyone goes on about it and you know start thinking in the back of my head well maybe I can just ride it. But eventually this just gets so steep and drops straight down very loose and rutted and there's no way you can ride that on a fully laden mountain bike.
Eventually cruising down the valley on the other side following the Jerry River brings you to the Big Hole River, one of the famous fly fishing spots in America. And eventually you get to the town of Wise River where you can resupply. You then follow one of the longer paved sections of the route uh, along the Pioneer Mountain Scenic Byway. Glorious scenery as you work your way through the mountains. Eventually you drop down into the historic Grasshopper Valley. This very scenic valley that's the heart of the farmland in the region. They even developed their own hay packing machines here about a hundred years ago and a few relics are still, you know, can be seen around the ranch land. Crossing some ranch land eventually gets you to Bannock State Park, first to the cemetery that date back to the 1800s and then to the little town that is incredibly well preserved. Most important part of a settlement town or mining town is obviously the bar. And there's some remnants of that here. We're in Bannock, Montana, or Bannock, Montana, which was the site of the original gold deposit. And this is the first settlement in Montana. It was even briefly the capital. A couple of cool old buildings remaining including the hotel, which is quite gorgeous. I continued heading south until it was time to start looking for a campsite for the night. Found a little side trail, fairly small and nondescript, and made my way up onto the top of this hill, where I was just in the middle of nowhere. I really couldn't see anything man-made in any direction. Had this beautiful sunset, and just this feeling of being in wild Montana. Good morning, Montana. Making my way further down the valley and some nice ranch land this morning. Seen a couple of these fascinating gates in Montana, just using wooden poles, completely built without, you know, metal hinges. Uh, they're quite fascinating and interesting. A little downhill before heading into the mountains again. Medicine Lodge Road takes you up and over until you get to the Medicine Lodge Sheep Creek Divide, another divide crossing. Yeah, it's after 11 in the morning and this is the first shady tree I found. Not much, but uh, a welcome respite uh, and a bit of refueling. Driving up the Grasshopper Valley earlier and some other farmland here in Montana. It's just interesting how remote it is out here and where these people made their homesteads. I mean, literally about a hundred years ago, you could still claim a homestead in these parts of Montana. And, uh, you know, we're passing through the Pioneer Mountains. Yeah, solo bicycling is very similar to me to, you know, a wagon trek or a cattle drive of the old days where you have to have everything with you, be completely self-sufficient, know where everything is on your metal steed now, maybe not your horse like in the old days or the wagon. And yeah, just travel through this gorgeous countryside that's harsh on the one side, but also has its own beauty. 
Um, there's certain, certainly a ruggedness out here or a remoteness, although everyone drives a big pickup and I guess can get to the Costco in the closest bigger town. But you're still far from most other places and out of cell signal. The neighbors better have a beautiful daughter if you grow up here. This has become my habit numerous times a day, whenever passing a nice clear stream, to dip my t-shirt and the uh, sun sleeves in the water and then put on the wet t-shirt, helps to cool you down and sometimes it dries out in 20 minutes but still the cooling effect is really quite nice. After cresting the pass, I ran into these guys, Bruce and Bob, all the way from Seattle, making their way southbound along the Tour Divide Trail as well. At the same time, a heck of a storm was brewing behind us, and uh, it's one of the afternoon features trying to dodge these storms, and sometimes you can't help but riding right into one because that's where the trail leads. Ah, the other side of cycling when you get into a thunderstorm. The first time of the ride I actually have to don the rain gear. It looks pretty ominous and lots of thunder and lightning. So we'll see what it's like. Dull sheep making their way up the ridge. This was a special treat for me to see some wildlife along the way. And while raising money for Zambia Carnival program, also nice to see that these are collared so they can be studied and tracked. Thankfully missed the worst of the hail. And then made my way into this little small town of Lima, Montana. 200 people in town and zero restaurants open on uh, whatever day it was in the afternoon. So I had to help myself at the gas station. Quite an interesting gas station. You can buy a semi-automatic rifle or a pistol there. And it's got its fair share of taxidermy. You know you're in Montana. Quirky town too. But I decided to push on a little bit and uh, get a few more miles in before sunset. Eventually going up the valley and making my way up towards Lima Dam. Big flyouts of birds in the morning. This Centennial Valley is um, a very important wildlife refuge area for bird life. Rather sparsely populated, a lot of the restrictions on ranching here made people move on and into other areas. But this area is also home to the Red Rock Lakes Wildlife Refuge. And as I mentioned, a very important breeding area for birds. Eventually the trail turns uphill again and you make your way up Red Rock Pass past some beautiful ranches until you get to the divide and the border with Idaho another state done beautiful trail along the river following an old railroad grade Used to be the train that took people to Yellowstone, but obviously it's been abandoned a long time ago. But it makes for some really cool, smooth riding and a wonderful experience as you work your way down. The last 20 miles has just been grooving down despite some soft soils in places and the scenery just keeps on giving. Getting close to the Wyoming border, 
and you can start seeing the Tetons in the distance. Entering Wyoming and soon after meeting the only Aussie I met on the whole trail, before starting down the Rockefeller Junior Memorial Parkway, making your way down into the valley for Grand Teton National Park. This is going to be an interesting morning. It rained all night and just stopped now a little bit after sunrise or around sunrise, but everything is drenched and wet. Warm and cozy inside the tent, but uh, thinking about how to pack it all up so that it uh, doesn't get everything else wet. Ah, always a new challenge to deal with, and that's the joy of doing this. After the night of wild camping and packing up the wet camp, it was lovely to enjoy the scenery of Grand Tetons National Park. Sort of juxtaposed by being on a busy road and people in RVs and clean t-shirts and family screaming, kids, the whole lot. Um, quite different from the remote areas that I've been into so far. As you grind your way up Tokwoti Pass to another divide crossing, you just have to look over your shoulder every now and then to see the beautiful views of the Tetons in the distance. Never far from fly fishing in Montana, but it was in this area at the top of the pass that I ran into some dreaded peanut butter mud that sticks to everything on your bicycle, even so much that you can't turn the wheels anymore, and it takes forever to use a stick or some implement to scrape the mud off and wash it off as best you can. Wisely decided to rather take the main road down before getting to the bottom and taking a sharp right turn, starting up Union Pass. Well, as I'm working my way through Wyoming, this little camp spot by the river in some rugged remote mountains up at 9,000 feet, it's going to be my stop for the night. Looking forward to a good decent wash. It's been a while and such an idyllic spot and music for the night. So nice to spend time deep into nature. Brrr, chilly this morning, up at 9,000 feet, and everything is covered in a thick layer of dew. Hoping stuff would dry out a bit overnight, but it's not to be, not this time at least. Cool to pack up in this conditions. It must be in the high 30s or low 40s. It was a great campsite last night. I didn't see a car for hours and hours before I got to the campsite. But of course, as soon as I strip down naked and plunge in the river to wash, a car stops on the bridge and, you know, starts scanning the river up and down, probably to find a good fishing spot. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, naked guy in the middle of the river, I think, surprised him a little bit. Next morning, crisp and clear, cool up at high elevations and riding over into the Teton National Forest to the famous Union Pass. One of the only places, one of two places actually in North America where the divide actually splits into three. Quite a remote area out here and uh, very unique too because of the different geological features. Battling some pretty hectic winds, I finally made my way all the way over to Pinedale, gateway to the Wind Rivers Range. Quite a nice little adventure town with a bit of character to it. And it was one of the last places I could resupply and I took full advantage of it and had a proper ribeye and veggies and a good beer at the brewery. Before riding out of town into the sunset, making a few more miles, seeing some cool llamas next to the road, and then getting to this little town called Boulder with population 115, quite unlike the Boulder that I live in, 
that's where you leave the main road and go back out into the mountains and the more wilder areas again beautiful in the late evening light Not many places to camp when it's still ranch land outside of Pinedale, Wyoming. Actually had dinner in Pinedale, then cycled down to Boulder and then went on the side road. But uh, couldn't quite get to the National Forest. And I don't know, from childhood I remember always hearing that the safest place to camp in an area you don't know is a cemetery. So when I saw a sign for an old 1800 cemetery, I turned up there and, uh, you know, just wild camped out here. Beautiful spot and uh, thankfully none of the people from the graves in the 1800s came to uh, wake me up at night. Lots of coyotes though and looks like different bands out dueling each other. And of course cows, I mean, I never knew they were so noisy in the evening and in the morning. But all good and a beautiful spot uh, right out here in the middle of nowhere. This morning I was riding along the historic Lander Cutoff Trail. This cut away from the original Oregon Trail that was used to settle the west. And it was a bit of a shortcut bypassed a whole desert stretch, had better water and was an easier way to get to the upper Green River Valley and help settle the area. All with a beautiful view of the Wind River Mountains in the background as you parallel them along the Lander Cutoff Trail. Some more open landscapes lead you to the historical mining town of South Pass City. This had its moment in the sun in the 1800s and on and off people try to mine in this area but it's beautifully restored and has a real pioneer feel to it. I then rolled into another iconic stop on the Tour Divide Atlantic City. Thought I was going to be able to find a store and resupply, but the only store is the Mercantile, which is actually more of a bar slash restaurant. And what an eclectic bar slash restaurant that is. The food is great though, the atmosphere is nice, and it gets you in the mood for setting out through the Wyoming basin. This is the last tree you'll see for the next hundred miles as you drop into the basin. Again, a fascinating geological feature where the actual continental divide splits up and runs around the rim of this basin. Any water in the middle will just drain into these salty lakes in the middle of the basin. Even out here, there are still some cattle, but mostly there's wide open space and the whole day that I crossed the basin, I did not see a single other vehicle. I did not see a single other human. Ah, the last morning of this leg of the trip, sunrise in the desert, and immediately the wind's back as well. It was nice and quiet overnight. Absolutely beautiful stars, you know, one of the darkest places in the US. A bit of cloud this morning, but it was clear overnight, and just gorgeous. Lying in the tent without the roof on and looking at the stars every time I wake up. What a nice way to end the trip. Under a cloudy sky, perfect riding conditions this morning. I was super excited to see some pronghorn. It's actually not an antelope species and its closest living relatives are giraffes and okapis. Who would have guessed that? The new desert animal 
quite unexpected to see this here. It looks fairly new, like they just started operating. But suddenly we have noddies all over this part of the basin. A pretty faint trail here. I think this is where it's supposed to go. Seeing some wild horses and so many of them was definitely the highlight of crossing the Wyoming Basin. Strange that they can survive in these harsh conditions. And look to be in such great condition. Well, further south you go on a bit of a slog, battling some pretty strong side winds that occasionally turn into headwinds, until you finally get to the town of Wormsutter. Not much to write home about, but my wife found a bar there where I met her, and uh, we celebrated the end of the trip with a couple of beers and a drive back to Colorado. Join me next year for part two.